right. Hello, everyone. My name is Cliff Smith. I'm the Washington Project Director of the Middle East Forum. Welcome to our speaker podcast and webinar series. Um, this will, or, event will run for about half an hour. It'll be a discussion between myself and my guest. And afterwards, um, we'll take any remaining time to answer questions from um, all our guests. And you can enter those questions at the bottom of the screen uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, anyhow, today my guest is Halil uh, Sayeg. Um, he is a Palestinian Christian um, born in Gaza. We met about two years ago um, when he came to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. to discuss uh, his life as a Palestinian Christian in Gaza and what um, are the issues that Palestinian Christians face. Uh, like most Palestinians, he was raised with negative stereotypes of Jews, and but was also forced, uh, was also as a Christian, was faced with discrimination, harassment, and, and other kinds of um, um, trauma from his Muslim neighbors. Um, this got much worse, of course, after the 2006 uh, takeover of Gaza by um, Hamas. Um, in 2008, um, Khalil um, flew, fled to the West Bank, where he was eventually able to establish residency. Uh, after graduating from Bethlehem Bible College with a BA in Bi Biblical Studies, um, he became a fellow at the Philos Project. This is an organization that seeks to engage um, Christians concerning the Middle East and the challenges there, um, and it is to promote pluralism and accept mutual acceptance in the region. Uh, Halil is now um, works to find common ground between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in that role, um, and he recently moved to Washington, D.C. permanently, or at least for the next foreseeable future, to continue his work with Philos and to study for his master's degree at, in political science at the American University. Welcome, Halil. Thank you, Cliff. Okay. I'll, I'll start off, um, as we said, um, and we're discussing issues with you, and we'll take questions from the audience at the end. Just to start off, um, what was it like growing up as a Christian in Gaza, uh, and why did you decide to flee to the West Bank? Sure, thank you for the introduction, Cliff. Um, to start with, uh, I was born to this uh, sort of like complex identity, sometimes I describe it. I was born as a Palestinian, I, I was born as a Greek Orthodox Christian, yet I was born also as a refugee. I, my family, uh, as they trace back their history to uh, 1948 to a city called Meshdal in the southern part of Israel today. And um, I was born to this identity that um, like things around me are shaped by, by what happened in 1948, known as the Independence Day of Israel for us Palestinians as we grow up describing it as Nakba, right? This, this catastrophe. So, so this is what primer, this is the primer thing that shaped my identity in my childhood. It wasn't so much as my Christianity or being a Christian Palestinian, it was more being a refugee because like being born to a refugee family means you have to attend a specific school, you have to attend an honorable school, you have to think of the world in a particular way. And this is this is this is was me born to a refugee family going to honor school, remembering every time that what happened in 1948 was such a catastrophe. Uh, it was actually, uh, Mahmoud Darwish described what happened in 1948 as like we were living in the paradise, and all of a sudden, like we fall from the paradise, and we are waiting for this sort of restoration, right? So this is this is how I grew up thinking of all these things. My father is more of a secular Arab uh, nationalist in the way he see the world, so he always taught me there is no dif difference between Christian or Muslim. We are all Arabs. We are all Palestinians. And this is sort of my upbringing, thinking that. We are Palestinians, we are ought to fight against this enemy, we are ought to be restored to 1948, and this is how I looked at the world. Yet start, starting attending an honor school and being in an over-majority Muslim society, an over-majority Muslim class, therefore, I was shocked that my Muslim viewers are also discriminating against me because I'm Christian. Uh, people would just make fun of me, make the mark of the cross and spit on it, spit on my face only because I'm Christian. I was shocked because my parents always told me there is no different. We are all Arab. Uh, we are, we have a common enemy, it's Israel, and, and we have a common, a common cause. So it was, it was shocking for me in this regard. Yet I, I, I managed to, to live with it. It wasn't like this was sort of institutional 
uh, discrimination against Christian in Gaza. And the contrary, actually, the government was much more pro-Christian than they would be uh, pro-Islamist. Yeah, but the Gaza Strip, uh, since the 50s, I would argue, has been a has been a ground for Muslim Brotherhood's uh, ideology. And for years and years, they have been successful in indoctrinating the society, especially among the law class in Gaza, uh, with more of a radical uh, understanding of Islam and more of a fanatic understanding. And this has reflected in our lives as Christian because our neighbors are uh, people who we are interact with, especially in the law class, would treat us unfairly. But I managed to live with that. Uh, but in 2006, after Hamas controlled the Gaza Strip, things became different because here you have these people who have all these prejudice against Christians who have this very narrow understanding of Islam and, and the world, uh, not only being in the society, but they control the government. All of a sudden, I had to, at certain age, you have to move from honor school at, at the great uh, mine to, to get to 10, you have to go to government school. And at that time, all of a sudden, my teachers are Hamas members because, you know, President Abbas asked all the Palestinian Authority teachers not to work anymore. And all of a sudden, I'm not only face, facing harassment from my peers, but also from my teachers. And that uh, was something um, new to me and perhaps new to the entire Christian community in Gaza. And this is was the, the point in my life where I start thinking, no, I can't live in this society anymore. I can't live in this city anymore. It's becoming a foreign thing that uh, going to the extreme and something that is uh, unattainable and I can't live here anymore. And not to mention, of course, you know, the difficulties that all Palestinians are facing giving the uh, separation with the West Bank and the Israeli blockade and the Egyptian blockade that is causing trouble for everyone. And I mean, of course, I understand how Israelis see it from their security perspective or whatever, but for us, uh, Palestinians, we are all uh, sort of suffering because of this thing. And I sort of looked at the situation, I saw the trajectory of economy of Gaza and everything, even as I was a 15 years old, but I thought like, I, 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 at that point, I started seeing people graduating from college at the age of 22 and not finding jobs and stuff. And I looked and I said like, there is no way I can do this. I, I, I can't live in this city. And I decided to move. And so how did your life change when you were able to go to the West Bank? Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, uh, people usually think of the Palestinian territories as sort of like there is one experience, one, uh, one life everywhere within the Palestinian territories. And to a certain extent, that's true with regard to their national identity, how they see the world with uh, relationship to Israel, all this sort of stuff. But I would argue the Gaza Strip since 2006, especially, but even before that, has become, has, not has become, have been always much more conservative uh in in terms of its um social order and also much more islamist but especially after 2006 the islamism in gaza has spread like crazy people because the government the institutions everything became became islamist and thus this had an, an, a very bad influence on on the christian in gaza as a matter of fact in 2006 we had about 4,000 christians living in the gaza strip among two million muslims uh, today we have less than a thousand christians living in the yeah. gaza strip now, you, that, could that, go ahead, go ahead. No. you could attribute that to a to, to whole different reasoning, right? There, there is a lot of core variables, but one thing that, one theme that I always hear Christians speaking about is that it's hard to live under an Islamist regime in the Gaza Strip. We can't do it anymore. We can't feel free anymore. We can't just be insulted all the time and our faith being insulted all the time and, and, and still live there. And that's they, they, they seek refuge uh, outside. Do you, I, I, this is related to the next question I was going to ask, and that is, um, you know, since um, uh, since 1950, the uh, Christian population of the Palestinian territories has went down from roughly 15 percent um, to today it's roughly two percent. And as you pointed out, in Gaza, it's gone down far further. I mean, in the last decade, it's gone from about 3,000 to about 1,000. I mean, you know, the estimates vary, but that's roughly the, the situation. So this is. Obviously, this is pronounced in Gaza. It's more pronounced in Gaza than the West Bank, but it's obviously both. Um, what do you see as the driver for this decrease? And what does it mean for Palestinian Christians? Yeah, this is a good question, Cliff. And it's a question that has been raised uh, many times. And you know, sort of the conventional wisdom for that is to, to look and to say the conflict is the main source of that. It's Israel, it's the occupation, et cetera. 
And uh, one has to not uh, dismiss this claim completely. I think that the occupation and the conflict has uh, been one of the main causes of that, but this is not specifically or particularly for Christians. This is for all Palestinians. Any land that has conflict, people would want to leave from this land, right? Uh, so, so it is the case that Palestinian Christians have been the most influenced from this entire conflict and people left due to the conflict. Uh, but, but this is not the only cause. There is other concerns that Christians have. And uh, there is a study that has been done by the Palestinian Center of Surveys and, uh, and, and Policy Studies in Ramallah in 2019 that the Philos Project funded. And uh, the founding of it was, was incredible uh, because it sort of pushed against this conventional wisdom. It did not deny the existence of the occupation at its influence. Matter of fact, one of the major uh, like finding we found is that people blame the occupation, which is a regular thing that all Palestinians do. But this, the, 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 the main motives for people leaving, one is economy, people are leaving because of economical hardship, and two, it's their concern of Islamism. Uh, it was really surprising to find that 77% of Palestinian Christians are worried about Hamas's presence in the West Bank and Gaza. 77%. And about 72% are worried about Islamist radicalism, who are much more like Salafist, ISIS sort of people in the region, like Syria and Iraq. They sort of look there and they go like, well, what if this thing happened here? And more interestingly, about 82%, um, and I, the numbers are like, I might have got it 1% wrong or something in the 80s. Uh, they are concerned about the Palestinian Authority corruption and they don't trust the institutions and they don't trust all of that. Yet all of them still say that uh, it is, or not all of them, majority of them in the 80s too, would say that still the, the best solution for the Palestinians is the um, uh, democratic sort of, sort of state. And it's actually interesting too that we find that Palestinian Christians um, like a majority of them would say that uh, one state solution is the best solution for Israel-Palestinian conflict. Unlike their Muslims, uh, fellow Muslims, Palestinians, they, they think differently in that regard. And a big minority of, of Palestinian Christians, which is really sad, 49% believe that their Muslims neighbors don't want them in this land. Yeah. This is so devastated. That, yes, yeah, that, actually, that actually really goes right to another question that I was going to ask, and that is, um, so you, you would say that the... Um, Radical Islam, um, you know, and more theocratic interpretations, you know, Muslim Brotherhood, Salafist, whatever you know the form it takes, you would say that has been on the increase in the Palestinian territories and among Palestinians in general. Is that correct? Sorry again. I didn't you think that you Islamism, that. radical Islam, has been on the increase in recent, say, the past ten or twenty years among uh, Palestinians? Is that correct? Well, I, I, I would say that. Um, I don't know if, uh, like, uh, perhaps I'll use a different terminology. I'll use uh, Islamist or political Islam. Sure, sure. Uh, but uh, I would say it, it has been an increase. And I think that the last uh, polling that came out of the uh, Palestinian territory, especially after the war in, 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 in May, has been concerned for, for me personally that over 70% would vote for Hamas. Now, you could, you could look at this data and say it's, a, it's such a reactionary thing to the war in Gaza. This is just an emotions. People are angry about, uh, you know, what happened in, in between Israel and Gaza, all this sort of stuff. Uh, but I think it goes deeper than that. The Palestinian society is it be, has become much more religious in the in the last few years, as the, the data is showing us. Religion is becoming more and more salient, and it's not always a bad thing. But in our experience, and as as far as the Palestinian Christians concerned, as the data show us, seventy seven percent are worried about Islamist groups. Now you could dismiss that. You could say this is whatever you don't want to accept it, but that's what the data and the evidence are showing. That is the common concern of, of, of these people. Now, you could argue that their concern isn't illegit legitimate and that Islamists would be good for Christians, as some would say, but still, Christians are concerned about, about Islamists, and this is a, this is a real thing uh, that, they are, that they are having. Uh, sadly, yes, this is a trendy thing more than, uh, more than before, and I hope that we'll find a creative way as Palestinian Christians to, one, combat that, but to have the dialogue to, to make things better for ourselves. Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it strikes me as, uh, you know, Palestinian Christians are, are often 
um, sort of between a rock and a hard place. You know, they are um, they're Palestinians, and um, but, but they are also not accepted by the majority, um, uh, and they are sort of um, you know stuck between some of the radical forces, um, many of the radical forces in the Palestinian um, society, but also between Israel. What what do you think? What role should they and can Christians play in trying to end the Israel Palestine uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict? Sure. Yeah, this is a good question, Cliff. I think that the first thing that we I have to really emphasize, and perhaps I wasn't clear with that, that our faith and our Muslims and Muslims brothers and sisters' faith cannot be the, like distinguished, right? We are Palestinian. We have such a common national identity, and I don't think any attempt to like sort of like distinguish us from our the Muslim majority in the Palestinian ter territories would be successful nor would it be helpful for us. I mean, there are all these negative things that we are experiencing with, with some Islamist group and stuff, but there's a lot of overwhelming uh, uh, great relationships between uh, Muslims and Christians. And I personally remember days when I was attacked by Islamists. And I, and I also remember a lot of Muslims who stood up for me, fought for me, and, and, and literally put their lives at stake for myself. So there is this unity and it's still there. However, there are also bad things that are happening. So I think as Palestinian Christian, we should uh, like keep, remain uh, firmly in our society and in our position, stay there and try to be light so we can bring about healing to our society. And that we could bridge the, the, uh, this gap between the Israeli society and the Palestinian society. And I think if we can do it, uh, if we can really reflect on ourselves and be, uh, critical of one, the Palestinian society, our, our policies and politics were in the last um, years. And if we also can look at the Israeli politics and society and can be critical of them, I think we could be uh, a force for good and we could bring uh, majority Muslims and majority Jews in the land to, to have better dialogue. However, sadly, I think that Christians being a minority and uh, have been feeling more and more, especially among the elites, I would say, and the clergy stuff, that they have been feeling more and more pushed toward uh, a defense position where you are always being betrayed as, oh, you have to prove your Palestinian hope because you are not Mus Muslim and because, you know, the, the last, uh, uh, you know, two decades have been more uh, led by the Islamist uh, sort of national movement, uh, not the secular, not Fatih anymore, but Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So Christian leaders feel more they have to be defensive. And because they feel they have to be defensive, they are trying to prove more their Palestinian hope, right? They are trying to, to prove more their nationalism and stuff. And this is not a helpful position because you just find yourself uh, following the stream, find yourself saying whatever the radicals want you to say in slightly different different form, in a more Christian, you know, uh, taste to it. But it's still nothing new. Like you are not really addressing the problems that your society have. And I would argue one of the main problems that our society have is the misunderstanding of the other. And the protecting the Jews as all bad and there is nothing good can come out of them, but like always blaming Israel, always blaming the West. And again, there are legit things like you, you could blame Israel for, for stuff. I mean, I'm a big critic of the occupation. I think the occupation should end, the state solution should be established. But there are responsibilities that we that we hold, especially our leadership. And as Christian, if I really want to be forced for good, I have to address these, these, these things so I can bring people together. And of course, I'm not claiming that Christians have special vocation on that. I think Muslim uh, citizens of Palestine have to do this too. But Christians have, um, have this unique position that they should use, I believe. Sure. Um, what is the Palestinian Christians relationship with uh, you know, non-Palestinian Arab Christians um, you know, in Egypt? in Syria, in Lebanon, or Christians in Israel, for that matter? Um, is they, do they have, uh, is there much of a relationship? Does it vary from community? Can you speak to that dynamic? Sure, yeah. Well, well, sadly, we don't have that strong relationship with Christians in Lebanon or Christian in Egypt, as, as far as I'm concerned. I think there are a few uh, families in Gaza who trace their, themselves back to Egypt and things. My family is one of them. They trace themselves 
uh, hundreds of years ago to Egypt. So there's this sort of, you know, affinity toward the Egyptian Coptic Christianity. Uh, in the northern part of Israel, I know some Christians there feel more connected to the Lebanese, but the majority of Palestinians sadly are disconnected from the Christians in the Arab world. They kind of look at them and they look at their experience and they compare it to themselves. And many times I hear them saying, well, we are in a much better place than they are. Uh, but in, in general, because of, you know, the separation before, because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and of course, you know, Israel's uh, uh, control over the West Bank, uh, there is not as much relationship with the broader Arab world uh, because of, you know, obvious reasons of the lack of connections between the two lands. Uh, I would think I would say we have positive relationships with Christians in Jordan. And, and a lot of them are Palestinian descent themselves who, who were who fled in the 1948 in Nakba. Um, the Christians in Israel, we have great relationships. Uh, matter of fact, my cousins are Christians who live in Israel. Uh, and, and, and majority of Christians in Israel, as far as I know at least, uh, consider themselves Palestinian Christians themselves. They do not consider themselves uh, Israelis. There is a movement in the North that is growing and um, considering themselves an Israeli. Uh, Christians, but majority of those who speak Arabic at least consider themselves Palestinian Christian, and thus we have strong family relationship and blood relationship with us in, in, in Israel. Uh, let me ask you one more question on this topic, then we'll move on to audience questions. Sure. Um, there, you've spoken to me at the times about um, Muslim converts to Christianity and told me some of their stories. Um, I, I don't want to get into any specific story which I know can be very sensitive for a whole lot of reasons. But um, what do you think, um, how do you think this plays out? I mean, how do they, how are they usually treated um, both by Christians by and by uh, Muslims in the region? Yeah, you're talking about converts from Islam, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, well, well, it's sad. It's a, it's a common thread in the uh, Arab Islamic world in general that uh, if you if you think you are persecuted or discriminated against as Christian descent yourself like myself, uh, I always say look at at convert our our brothers and sisters who converted and you see what persecution really because these are people who their life would be threatened to death sometimes by their family members and extended family and stuff like that. I would say in the West Bank, uh, I don't think there is any legal actions against them that they wouldn't go to jail, for example, or investigated with something like that. In Gaza, we had incidents like that where people being tortured by Hamas, forced to deny their faces, stuff like that. In the West Bank, we never had cases like that. However, uh, uh, with regard to, to the law, they are discriminated against because legally they can't convert. And once you convert, you find yourself stuck. You are one, unable uh, to get married because you know you can't really get married at church because you're a Christian, but on your, the database of the government, you're a Muslim. Uh, and, and then two, the Christians wouldn't really accept you because they are suspicious of you all the time that, oh, you are a Muslim, you converted, why did you convert? Maybe you work with, with some tourist or whatever. And it's it's really sad uh, situation. So I would say uh, their situation, similar to the converts in the entire Arab world, is really bad and, and, and something that has to be thought of um, carefully and creatively because we know that we wouldn't be all of a sudden able to, to change these countries to free liberal democracies. They are uh, the first or second amendment of most of these countries are Sharia and Sharia is very clear that uh, this is something completely uh, forbidden. So we have to be thoughtful of how do we address this human rights uh, issue in these countries. Uh, on that issue, um, um, do you, th this is a question from Richard Hellman um, from our guest and, um, do you believe that the U.S. government um, or other international community has, um, what, what do you think, can they play a helpful role, I guess I should say, in um, dealing with, you know, the rights, violation of the rights of Palestinian Christians in the West Bank and, um, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, as I, I have to be clear, with regard to Christian uh, uh, Palestinian Christians in the West Bank, especially, there is no institutional discrimination against us from the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I think it's more of a societal issue. The 
the teaching of a particular understanding of Islam that encouraged discrimination toward Christians is becoming more and more prevalent, uh, like more and more salient, sorry, in, in the West Bank, similar to what happened in Gaza. And that what is ought to be, uh, you know, confronted. And I, I know as a matter of fact, from my conversation with leadership and the Palestinian Authority, that they're trying to do that. They don't want this to be more spread, also because it's a threat for themselves too, uh, as the government of, of those things. However, it's a society issue. But that being said, there are there are some laws that has to be, you know, uh, modified to be more exclusive for everyone and not only for, for Muslims in, in that in that country. And there are things that can be taken. And I think the 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 United States being one of the major donors for them could pull strings in that regard. They could have them do something. And I always say they Palestinian authority is not a state yet, and uh, it's about to be at a certain point. We don't know when. I think there is this is something to be decided in negotiation with Israel. But I think that the West, if they really take more seriously issues of human rights, especially freedom of religion, they could always put conditions for the Palestinian Authority be before they give them anything, before they are recognized as a state. I think the Palestinian Christian issue should be major issue, especially people who convert, and even people who are atheists and don't want to believe or anything. They should have the right to, to just be whatever they want to be, believe whatever they want to uh, believe. So I think pressure is always good. Uh, once, you know, they start uh, negotiating or something right now, I don't think uh, anything could be done. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, um, do you believe that, um, this is from an anonymous attendee, um, do you believe it is poverty or extremism that poses the greatest threat to younger um, Palestinians in Gaza? I, I, I don't see like, why is it a question of either or? I mean, could be both. I mean, poverty is bad uh, in the Gaza Strip. I think that the economy, uh, like unemployment in Gaza is above 77%. That's crazy. That's not acceptable. That's not something that and that this is not a society anyone wants to live in. So in, a, in that regard, yes, poverty is a problem, unemployment is a problem, no one wants to not have work, but extremism is, 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 is a problem for, for them too. And I will give you just one example in Gaza, being under the control of, uh, of Hamas. If you want to find uh, uh, a job in the government, which is, by the way, the biggest you know, employer in the, in the Palestinian territories, you go to the government office, you try to find a job, and you go, and the first question they ask you in Gaza is, which mosque do you pray in? Right? They don't want to ask you, are you Christian? I mean, most likely they know, but they want to know which mosque do you pray on. And to be honest, even if you are a secular Muslim, it means like you're out. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't find the job, right? So there is that, right? There is the fact that you're Christian, single you out from even government jobs, you can't find job, single you out in every aspect of the society in Gaza. Now, now the sad part is, is after years of living under this regime in, in Gaza, people who are Christians there that don't understand any better, don't see the world outside, don't understand what is freedom, they sort of like come to this mentality where they're thinking, oh, that's okay. They, because they don't, they almost forgot what does it, what it used to look like before Hamas controlled Gaza. Before they didn't travel and they're not allowed to travel due to the siege to outside and see what the world looked like. And what is this uh, suppressive regime look like that we are living in in Gaza? That's something important to understand because many times you talk to people in the Gaza Strip and they don't get it. They don't want to say, oh, no, we are not facing a problem. There's two reasons to that. One, it could be that these people really don't know better. Two, they are scared. And there are incidents. And if you, if you do your research where leaders of Christian community in Gaza said stuff and then had to, 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 to boil it up. I had to pull it and they had to apologize because all of a sudden you have uh, this very powerful regime coming to you and saying, no, you can't say this and you, you can't help it. You just want to survive, right? And I don't blame them for that. One last question. We could talk all day. There's so much to talk about. But um, um, do you have an opinion on um, the closing of the PA's office in DC? Do you believe this had any effect on Palestinian Israeli peace talks? This is from an anonymous attendee. I, I don't think it was any help to anyone, to be honest. I think that, um, like, yeah, it's not that I saw that their office here was doing some incredible job. I think it was 
<laughs> waste of money from a Palestinian perspective. You are wasting uh, probably millions of dollars to have these people here living a fancy life and then nothing has been, been, been done. But to keep the channel open is more and more helpful than, than to close it. Uh, however, it hasn't had negative or positive view, view. I mean, I was concerned at that time when America cut all the relationships with, with the Palestinian Authority, that the Palestinian Authority would move war toward Russia and Iran, and that they would become more and more extremist, especially that they had historical ties to these countries. You know, President Abbas specifically had a unique relationship with the Soviet Union back in the days, and, uh, and, and the Palestinian uh, uh, the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, some of the members of the executive directors have a great relationship with Iran, so I was concerned about that. However, President Abbas chose to wait for the next administration. He said, oh, he, he most likely thought, oh, Biden will come or someone from the Democrats will come, things will reopen and we'll have this relationship. And I think that was good because we didn't move to, to more like, you know, suppressive sort of regimes outside because I think if the U.S., uh, cut relationships with the Palestinian Authority or any Arab country for that say, I think the danger would be always that they would move more toward Russia and, and Iran. And, and once you do this, you no longer have leverage over them, right? And once you don't have leverage over them, how would you hold them accountable for human rights? How would you hold them accountable for peace? How would you hold them accountable for all sort of the good things that we wanna see in, in the Middle East? Thank you very much. I really appreciate your perspective. It's always good to hear um, you know, different people's perspective on these complicated and sensitive issues. Um, anyhow, we hope you will join us next time for our, our new series. Um, and uh, just thank you very much for joining us all. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.